Okay. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Again, uh, welcome to this week's seminar. This week we have um, Elif Surer Hoca from uh, Meteor Informatics uh, Institute. Um, Elif Hoca received her uh, PhD degree in bioengineering in 2011 from Italy, University of uh, Bologna. Uh, she received her master's and B uh, bachelor's of science degrees in computer engineering from Boise University. Um, between 2013 and 15, she worked as a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Milan in, the, uh, in an EU project, where she developed video games to rehabilitate stroke and uh, neglect patients. After that, she joined uh, Matthew um, Berger School of Informatics, a modern and simulation department in 2015, and she's currently working there as an assistant professor. Uh, she's a mentor at Matthew Design Factory and Bank Art Innovation Prix. Um, maybe she's going to talk about that today. Um, she collaborates as a researcher in several um, national and uh, EU funded projects. Her research interests um, include serious games, virtual, mixed reality, and reinforcement learning. So, uh, this is going to be really an interesting talk. And we are very happy to have you here at Fojan with us. And the screen is yours. Thank you so much, Sinanojan, for this very nice introduction and uh, your invitation. Uh, welcome, everyone. Today, I will uh, give an introduction to the game research mainly. So it's going to be like a series of uh, different applications, what we are doing and what's the scope. So um, it's not going to be a very technical uh, seminar, but it's going to be an uh, overview. So first of all, I would like to start with some terminology because uh, I do notice that um, some of the uh, definitions are misused and they are used uh, interchangeably even though they shouldn't be. First of all, I will start with the virtual reality, augmented reality and mixed reality. They are uh, used interchangeably, but actually they do refer to different uh, environments and th therefore they do require different uh, requirements. So first of all, virtual reality is the broadest concept of all. And uh, as the name suggests, uh, we are talking about a completely virtual environment. We don't have anything uh, from the real life materials and you are expected to enter a complete immersive world. When we are talking about augmented reality though, uh, the reality itself is always with us, but the virtuality is only like a layer on top of that. So you can think about like the Snapchat filters, uh, where you do add another layer or um, think about the uh, automation uh, applications where uh, whenever your washing machine uh, doesn't work and uh, you, do, you would like to learn the instructions how to fix it and it's possible to add a virtual uh, layer to show you how to do so. But when we are talking about mixed reality it is the most complex of all and we are uh, in this scenario, we are dealing with holograms, uh, three dimensional uh, images formed by the uh, in inference of light beams from a laser. And we do actually not only do see them, observe them, but also we do interact with them. That's the main difference uh, when compared with the uh, augmented reality. Today, I, uh, I will also talk a lot about the serious games, but I would like to again, clarify the terminology via uh, video games, serious games and simulations. What are we talking about when we are talking about this? So um, video games, uh, I'm sure that you are all familiar with it. It's the a computer game uh, is a com computer uh, control software where you do have the game physics, uh, interaction, objects, scenarios, and so on. And the main purpose is entertainment. That, that's like the core of uh, video games. And these are uh, some of the posters from our uh, game development pipeline course uh, from our uh, students. But when we are talking about the serious games, and I don't actually like this definition a lot, the serious adjective comes from the fact that uh, the institutions that do require or want those games are in general serious games like universities, uh, hospitals, or education. And uh, that's why this uh, serious uh, adjective is there. When we are talking about the serious games, we are talking about games, not only in the entertainment, but they do have some additional alter ulterior motives. But this, this doesn't mean that serious games are not going to provide fun or entertainment. Actually, 
in order to call them a game, they should be entertaining. So that, that's the, like the core definition. And here you can see uh, some of the uh, applications that we have developed for uh, the children with Down syndrome uh, for their physical and uh, cognitive exercises. So basically these serious games um, topic was, uh, I, I was introduced to that topic uh, when I was in, at University of Milan and uh, there was this project called Rewire. So the Rewire was a, a European Union FB7 project and the main idea was that um, since there are lots of uh, elderly population in Europe, and since after the stroke, uh, the uh, rehabilitation takes a lot of time, the idea was that uh, to uh, switch all those uh, rehabilitation to the patient's houses, ba basically. And uh, apart from the fact that uh, the stroke was the main motivation there, there is a, some, with some patients, there is this side effect of stroke. So even though you don't have any problem with your eyes, um, let's say that if you do have stroke on your right side, you do not perceive the object on your left side. I mean, it's not a visual problem, it's a, a brain damage related problem. So for example, uh, whenever the uh, medical doctor asks you to uh, comb your hair, you, do, uh, look, you are looking at the mirror and you are only combing right, like the right side of your hair, even though you don't notice it. Or whenever you want them to eat something, they only eat the right side of the plate and they, don't, they are not aware that uh, there, there are also, uh, there's also food on the left side. Because of that, we had used this uh, Novint Falcon, the device that you see here, and we have reprogrammed it so that whenever, uh, an, uh, during a game, whenever an object is not seen on the left side for a long time, uh, we are programming that handle to take the patient towards that target. Or uh, whenever, let's say, you need to pick up an, uh, pick an apple from a tree, whenever you do pick that tree, you do feel the weight of this force controlled device. So that the idea is not only have a, a cognitive impact there, but also having a physical outcome so that uh, uh, the rehabilitation for the neglect patients is done. So this was how I entered, let's say, to the world of uh, serious games. Uh, and in the rewire, we not only uh, developed games, but we had developed a game engine. At that time, uh, it was very difficult to switch uh, several different uh, instrumentation. That's why we have uh, built a game engine where it is possible to use like uh, we fit uh, with the uh, Novint Falcon or Kinect and so on. So it was quite uh, adaptive to those changes. And these are some of the games that we had developed for the uh, neglect patients. And some of them only focus to the fact that this right and left uh, vi visuality, but some of them are also having this force related back, uh, feedback so that they can have a, another level of difficulty for the patients. And uh, since the patients uh, should uh, rehabilitate at home, uh, we were the ones responsible from the fact that if they are doing the exercises correctly, because think about that, I mean, these people are elderly, they will be using these games for the first time. And if they do fall, let's say from the VFIT, it's going to be our responsibility, that's why uh, real-time feedback was very important and uh, we, we were uh, using the uh, color-coded feedback to monitor uh, both via uh, VFIT and also the uh, Kinect. So uh, why are the serious games uh, this much of applicable to different uh, training programs, rehabilitation programs and so on? Uh, it, it is mainly the fact that it is like the intersection point of like the training, simulation, uh, sports and board game, computer games. So you, you have all different components. You still do have the entertainment uh, component, experience and multimedia. And also it is very easy to map a, a game uh, like a, a, from the education system. Because think about our education system, we do have like uh, assignments, uh, at the end of the assignments, you are like being graded. Uh, there is this um, list of successful students. So uh, there is this leaderboard and so on. So it's very easy to map it like a game because they are very similar. 
Uh, but whenever we are talking about the simulation, actually simulation doesn't need to have any interaction, any visuals at all. I mean, if you ask me uh, what, uh, what temperature it's going to be tomorrow in Ankara, and if after running some calculations, if I do say to you like 25 degrees, this is also a simulation. So they don't need to be visual and uh, they can be, uh, and they don't need to be interactive. The main difference uh, from the games is that interactivity part and also the entertainment part, of course. So first of all, I will start with a very recent uh, study that we have done. Actually, it was like accepted last week. Uh, this was a study with my um, master thesis student, Ozan, and uh, we have pursued, uh, we have developed like five different games for uh, specific learning uh, difficulties, SPLD. Uh, so whenever we are talking about SPLT, we are not talking about a problem uh, regarding intelligence or anything, but there are only problem, um, let's say difficulty or uh, some sp speed problems in reading, writing, and so on. And there are different uh, type of uh, motor skill uh, damage as well with the SPLT. And uh, the most known type of it is uh, dyslexia, and uh, it causes spelling errors and slow and false reading. Uh, there, are, there is also dyscalculia, uh, and children in general uh, do have problems understanding mathematical concepts, so which is taller, which is greater. They don't have this uh, comparison uh, ability. And uh, another one is dysgraphia, and uh, it, it again uh, leads to writing problems. And uh, the students uh, are in general using like mis incorrect size or uh, shaped letters. And there are also other nonverbal learning difficulties, uh, oral written uh, language disorder, and specific reading comprehension deficit, and so on. Uh, so far in the literature, uh, what, what's done is that in general, um, this special education is only concentrated only on one type of the uh, SPLD. But as we know, there are uh, some, some students, some children may have like a mixture of them. And we have developed because of that five different games to target all different uh, sets of SPLD. And uh, th that was the main difference uh, from the literature. And uh, we have also uh, added the adaptive difficulty system to two of those uh, developed games uh, so that we wanted to see if uh, uh, changing the difficulty uh, according to the uh, performance of the player, if it's going to make any change or so. So what we did was uh, we, we have developed, after uh, developing these games, uh, we, we had done several different prototypes. First of all, we talked with the educators of a special education uh, uh, training center. And uh, after their suggestions, we had built like the pr pr second prototype. Then uh, we made 23 uh, children with uh, SPLD to play those and give us feedback. And then we added adaptive difficulty. Then we had a second interview and so on. So it was like a, a two-phase study uh, with students uh, uh, and their educators. So uh, we, we developed a word, word game, uh, which was focusing mainly on the spelling, uh, and it was targeting dyslexia. And it, we tried to keep the um, games very simple because we didn't want to uh, distract them, and multitasking is not very helpful uh, during training. And it, it has a very simple mechanism. It uses like drag and drop, and uh, only the correct letters are accepted after dropping. Uh, and then we had a memory game, uh, and uh, there were different versions of that after the suggestions from the educators. So mainly it was uh, on color base and then the directions of the arrows and uh, different, um, especially misused characters like D, P, B, and Q, which were uh, in general misuse, and also uh, the uh, picture version uh, on the fourth uh, prototype was developed. And we also had a second game, the category game, and there were like five different topics and 20 predefined answers. And this as well has been through several different prototypes, a different type of 
uh, key keyboard and uh, the interaction mechanisms did change and open-ended and multi-choice uh, uh, questions were added. And uh, on the final prototype, the uh, input type uh, was also changed. We also had the space game. Uh, we uh, purposefully added this uh, to the set of games. It was the most like dynamic one where uh, children should have uh, used their motor, motor skills as well. And it was a survival game. And uh, we had updated the visuals after their feedback. And we changed the uh, jo joystick in terms of the uh, input mechanism. And so the, all these changes were uh, from the students themselves and their educators. And we had the math game uh, for the discalcula uh, here as well. The idea is to the, the, the summation and uh, subtraction multiplication operators with the kites and uh, you need to catch them before they uh, fly and so on. And for the adaptive difficulty, we had uh, used this um, system to two of the games, not to all of them. And the idea is that we are checking the performance of the player and uh, depending on their performance, we are having a rule-based system and adjust the difficulty depend depending on that. And afterwards, we also checked, uh, I mean, apart from the correct answer and false answers and so on, we also asked the students if they had noticed something different uh, between the different uh, versions of those games. And uh, the adaptive uh, difficulty uh, results were uh, mainly uh, have shown us that uh, the range between the uh, errors have uh, diminished because the, it was way more uh, similar to their uh, performance and what they were doing. Uh, and we, we were doing a very simple uh, else if uh, sort of rule-based uh, adaptive difficulty uh, mechanism for that. And ch uh, only one child has noticed that there was something different with that. And uh, for the data of acquisition, I mean, we were lucky that we had finished them uh, just before the pandemic. It was, it, uh, we finished the study in uh, March 2020. And the, uh, we had uh, done all this um, data acquisition like in a six month period uh, from the 23 students and 10 educators. And as I said, uh, after different prototypes, uh, different acquisitions were made. And um, the educators took the system usability uh, scale that we are using a lot with the uh, game development and also the technology acceptance so that we can understand if the UX is uh, good enough and if we need to change something and so on. And um, the uh, main, main need, space game and the um, math game were liked a lot. Uh, the word game was found a little bit difficult and we made changes depending on that. But uh, the reaction to the uh, questionnaires and the games were very positive. And especially after the uh, second interview, we had seen that the deviation from the uh, negative statements uh, have uh, decreased a lot. And we also had uh, acquired, acquired student feedback and also educators feedback uh, in a qualitative way uh, so that we have applied some of them already, but there are also, there's also available uh, future work on those commands. And uh, this is the one from the educators and how to improve those games uh, way better. And uh, we had checked for each of the game, uh, the correct answer, fall, false answers for the, before the first interview and then the second interview. And we had tried to see the pattern and how well they are doing and how the adaptivity and the standard version do ma make a difference. As you may have seen, uh, the, uh, both the time span and also the uh, correct answers become way more like sparse and uh, they, they, are, they do show that the students become way more focused and uh, the changes do diminish. So uh, the games were found uh, to be easy to use and the uh, outcomes were quite positive. Actually, uh, now they will be using it as part of their curricula. And we would like to thank a lot uh, this lab uh, association uh, for their help uh, because with, without their help, we wouldn't be able to learn uh, this phenomena and how to improve uh, the uh, games on that sense. So th this was a recent study and it was mainly 
an example to the serious game. Now I will switch to uh, several different things that we have been doing from the uh, collaborators from METU. Uh, first of all, I will start with uh, our uh, collaboration with the Department of Architecture. Uh, Ipek Uca was also a speaker here. So uh, this is a uh, study that we have uh, performed all together, uh, mixed reality uh, and virtual reality in architecture. The project was called Polark. So here as well, what we did was uh, the architects are using uh, building information models uh, when they are uh, designing the houses and uh, also for the visualization purposes. What we did was we had developed an end-to-end -end, um, pipeline uh, from the uh, Autodesk Revit, uh, which is the uh, BIM software that they are using, uh, so that you can, uh, as an architect, you can change the houses uh, via either VR uh, using VR headsets or HoloLens for the uh, mixed reality version. And you can change them at new, uh, let's say, uh, doors, at new windows, and so on. And in the real time, you can also see the daylighting and uh, the temperature of the house and to see the impact of those changes uh, in the tools that you are developing. And also, whenever you do those changes, the Revit side is also uh, updated immediately. On the um, upper side, you can see the visuals from the uh, mixed reality. Uh, as you have seen, uh, this is a hologram and it is actually the corridor of uh, our institute. Uh, and you do see that rea reality is still there but you do interact with that uh, 3D hologram. And this is the uh, virtual reality version of the whole art project. And uh, all these, um, you do see these uh, colored uh, cube uh, balls of spheres there, and they are uh, modeling the uh, daylight uh, of the uh, house and the visualization part of it. And uh, it is uh, the UI uh, is uh, changed like three times. Uh, we had done several different versions of this, and uh, we have evaluated each uh, software development cycle as well. And this was another study that we have again uh, performed with uh, Ipekoja. Uh, I'm sorry for this uh, black background, but actually this is a mixed reality application. So whenever you do take the uh, HoloLens, you do see those icons, but also the reality itself. So it is not all black, black. And here the idea is to having a basic design tool. Uh, basic design is a very important uh, design course uh, for the uh, Department of Architecture students. It's like the, their study on the first year. And uh, unfortunately, before getting familiar with the 3D world, they are immediately starting to like the cut uh, the uh, papers and design that way. And it's, it's a very difficult process for them. That's why we thought, why don't we teach the basic design pr principles first in the mixed reality and then uh, after they do feel confident about how to think, how to design in 3D, then they can switch to the uh, real world uh, where, with the paper design. We had made a similar study with Vikant University uh, for, from uh, with Yasemin Afajan Hoca. And there we had developed a virtual reality system uh, where we have also developed uh, the, uh, we, we had also analyzed the differences between the paper-based design and also the virtual reality and how effective all those solutions. In another uh, example of the serious game, this was a collaboration uh, with Sherin Moja and uh, Ceren Inji was my master's student. Um, th there is this excavation uh, center, excavation place uh, in Kayseri, which is called Kiltepe. And it is the main core, uh, let's say, place where the, the industry and exchange of goods have has started. So it has a very important uh, impact and value in the history. And uh, we had developed a, a tablet-based uh, serious game in order to teach the education, social life, trading, law, and uh, geography of that place because uh, Kiltepe Museum was about to be uh, established and we had, uh, and the idea was to continue the experience after uh, con continue the uh, visit from the uh, museum itself. And these are some of the screenshots from the uh, Kültepe gaming. In another uh, collaboration, uh, the uh, European uh, Network of CBRN Training Centers, ENOTIS, 
This is a European Union uh, project for mainly, uh, it's a networking project for chemical, biological, ra radiological, and nuclear uh, events. And we as METU, we were at the beginning responsible from uh, developing an online game uh, at the end of the project. Uh, but after uh, getting involved with the project, there are uh, these visits and which are called joint activities, uh, where mainly we do see uh, real life scenarios played by the institutes, like uh, let's say if there is a contamination, if there is a, a CBRNE attack, how to respond, let's say that uh, you're in a hospital and so on. Uh, after making all those visits and so on, we noticed that actually all those scenarios that uh, they are playing in real life, they do have a very uh, concrete structure. So it is very easy to divide them to action events and uh, key performance indicators. So that's why we thought that um, instead of like having a single game at the end, uh, why don't we uh, create something uh, more, let's say, reusable? And the, uh, at the beginning, there was this reaction in the uh, CBRNE community. Uh, they were not very sure if they would be useful because I'm going to show you some pictures from, the, uh, from those exercises. They are using very uh, professional equipment and so on. And so that's why we wanted to make sure that, I mean, this is not a replacement for the real exercises, but this is something for the training so that Let's say that that exercise, the real exercise is done once a year, but you can play this game and uh, remember the key uh, motivators and the key uh, actions that you need to do in those emergency situations. So that's why we, we made, made it clear that it's not going to be a cure for all. It's just going to be uh, something to um, uh, give for the training. For example, this is a joint activity which was uh, which we organized with, uh, uh, with the University of Nimes, and it was played in France. Uh, so we are uh, in a hospital right now, and uh, you do see the screen there. There is this uh, emergency attack uh, happening in an aeroplane, uh, airport, sorry. And then all these units do communicate with each other how to uh, allocate, let's say, beds, in the hospital with whom to talk and so on. So they are playing a real life scenario uh, for two hours and then the timeline is changing, the situation is changing and all these nurses, medical doctors and so on, they are trying to play if they can uh, really uh, continue with the correct um, actions. And this one is from uh, Belgium. And in this one, there is this CBRNA attack. And as you see, uh, this time the police is involved and they do see uh, all these decontaminator suites and so on. And they are trying to understand the material which was, uh, uh, which was uh, developed in a clandestine uh, laboratory. And so this is like the uh, interaction mechanism of that exercise. So as I said, after visiting all these exercises and so on, we said that why don't we create a game generator instead of creating a single game so that um, we can adapt it for different uh, scenarios. We can break it down to different interaction mechanisms and so on. And that, that's what we had done. So we basically do have the uh, main interaction map uh, from the Unity controller. And then what we do is that after we do uh, create those um, interactions uh, by changing the tags of uh, the assets, we, we are just replacing those, let's say all those simple shapes are just replaced with the ones on the uh, second line and uh, you can continue to play. Uh, and the first uh, section is good for the, especially the practitioners to make sure that they are uh, designing the game correctly and they do test it in an easier way. And after we developed those games, uh, what we did was we organized a joint activity in uh, Ankara. Uh, it was just before the pandemic, like 28th of February that week. Uh, and uh, our visitors, practitioners who have been to those, uh, both the Brussels and the France scenario, they have arrived to Turkey and they have played our games. We had adapted all the games to both the virtual reality and mixed reality. 
And also for the joint activity in Turkey, we collaborated with the uh, Department of uh, the Metro Department of Mining. And what we did was we went to Eskişehir and you do see this uh, on the upper side, uh, this mine uh, in Eskişehir, we had modeled it and they had tested the games both in the uh, virtual reality and mixed reality there. And we were able to see also their reactions to the Brussels and uh, France scenario. And this was the, uh, the upper one is the replica of that mine in Eskişehir. And we also continued to, uh, with this collaboration with Mustafa Erkay Hoca uh, from the uh, Department of Mining. Now we have uh, started a new project that he is uh, supervising. And we are trying to uh, create uh, emergency scenarios for the uh, mining. Then uh, during the pandemic, we also collaborated with the civil engineering department. And we said that if uh, we are switching to this online education system, why don't we uh, just uh, build some games for the, um, for the laboratories as well? And uh, actually, these days, we are about to finish the data acquisition uh, from those games. Now I will switch to another topic in terms of the game research. So, so far we had talked about the extended reality, serious games and like developing games for so that uh, people do play this. And what if we do use it in a different mechanism in order to uh, test uh, some machine learning uh, components and reinforcement learning? I will just briefly uh, enter this world of, let's say, uh, reinforcement learning. When we are talking about reinforcement learning, uh, we are talking about an agent uh, which interacts with its environment. And due to that environment, the, uh, the environment is sending some uh, observations and uh, some reward mechanisms, and the, uh, the agent decides what to do. And after uh, deciding on that action, uh, the uh, outcome is uh, given as a reward. So you can think it like the learning mechanism that uh, we are mainly uh, using uh, as kids. So for example, our uh, families do say us, don't touch the, uh, that, that's hot, too hot, don't touch it. But we do touch it and we do see that it's quite hot and it is the reward mechanism that uh, punishes, us, uh, punishes us, but also teaches us a lot. So all these uh, reward action and observation mechanisms uh, are used to uh, train our agent so that it can learn how to behave in that environment. And this is a very interesting topic. And we, we do have um, concepts like exploration and exploitation. And the idea is if, let's say that if we do know that one action works quite well and we do get quite good rewards on top of that, should we always continue with that same uh, choice, with, the, with that same reaction? or should we also like explore? And uh, to test all these mechanisms and uh, to uh, train those agents, games are perfect actually. They, they are very easy to develop, especially if we're talking about like the 2D grid environments and uh, you can create uh, agents as entities. A reward mechanism is already available in the game. So it is a very good uh, test bed for these uh, reinforcement learning environments. And but um, mainly it is used um, as, as the purpose in terms of the game player agent. So that we would like to agent to uh, have the highest score in the end so that to collect, let, let's say, highest amount of rewards. But uh, test, for the testing pur purposes, it was not used that much. That's why we said that, why don't we use it for game testing? So that instead of like human players, why don't we have a uh, game testing agents who are going to find the bugs in our games? To do so, we had used this uh, general video game uh, AI and we developed uh, simple 2D games. And uh, to test this, to propose this agent mechanism, we had used like two approaches. One of them is the synthetic uh, test goal. The other one is human-like test goal. Synthetic test goal is mainly uh, taking the uh, gameplay data, game, gameplay uh, scenario from the game developers and also modifying it, adding some randomness to it so that to create like alternative game testing paths in a synthetic way. Human-like test goals is the one 
where we had acquired um, uh, data from human testers. They, they tested our games, and uh, we had uh, used the uh, MGP IRL to extract the uh, test goals from those trajectories. I think there's something in the chat. Okay, thank you, uh, Emrejan. Uh, so, um, sorry about that. So the idea is uh, from those human tester agents, if we can extract some test goals and if our agent can use them and if it's going to uh, improve its uh, testing performance. So uh, the first contribution was that it was the uh, for first time to propose the human-like uh, tester agent. And also this synthetic agent was also an improvement of, over very simple scenario testing. And our results have shown that we had tested these um, test agents with the Monte Carlo tree search and also SARSA, which is state action, uh, reward state action uh, agent types. And uh, we had tested it with different games, three, three different type of games, and also with different like baseline agents, uh, synthetic agents and human-like agents. And this human-like touch also has increased the uh, testing performance. After doing this uh, study, we also made a, a parallel study to that. We were dealing a lot with the Monte Carlo tree search, and we just wanted to uh, check if uh, some modifications or updates to the Monte Carlo tree search algorithm can also uh, increase our uh, game testing performance. Uh, with the Monte Carlo tree search, we are like having four main stages. Uh, so first of all, uh, we are starting, and these are all like the set of action items that we can choose. Uh, that's why we do have this tree and uh, all these actions do lead to new actions, new choices and so on. And at the beginning, we start randomly with a selection. Then we do expand the tree by uh, experiencing the next action items and seeing their results and so on. And after a point, we just follow the simulate the rest of the tree and then uh, go back and back propagate the weights and the probabilistic outcomes that we have acquired. Then we said that why don't we use different algorithms to uh, increment this performance. I'm not going to go much into the, the technical details of that, but the methods that we were using was mainly either we were like reusing the uh, tree structure or we were using some uh, single players where the uh, idea was having a greedy approach only or in another approach we were changing the exploration and exploitation dilemma, or in one of them, we were only using like bold actions and all these different modifications uh, helped us create uh, different agents. And we use the same um, environments that we had uh, developed for the first game. And uh, there as well, we had uh, introduced several different bugs and we had reused the human tester data. And we had seen that all those uh, improvements have helped us to increment the uh, human likeness effect and also the outcome even better. And uh, these were some of the experiments that we have proposed and uh, the size, the grid size and the difficulty of the games were changing as well. So the uh, questions were if the computational, the change in the computational budget, how, how it's like, handled, what kind of modifications do enhance the MCTS and so on. I will uh, start like the final part of my talk and I will keep it quite short. So uh, another study that we have performed uh, based on like, reinforcement learning was uh, re relational reinforcement learning. So with the relational reinforcement learning, the main idea is that so far um, the environments were treated like uh, the images and the idea is to understand uh, their relation on that image. So for example, you do see uh, the image on the left side and you are trying to uh, ask some questions and see if they are next to each other, if uh, they are, let's say, close to each other and so on. So they, you, do, uh, you do try to answer very simple questions and try to understand where they are in terms of relation. And so, for example, we do have this non-relational question, is the yellow object on the top or on the bottom? Or the relational uh, the question is always with the, what is the color of the object that's closest to the blue object? So what is the relation 
to those. And uh, to, to extract all those relation mechanisms, there is this uh, multi-head dot product attention network, uh, and it was mainly used with the natural language processing because um, thanks to the, let's say, uh, NLP, uh, whenever we are talking, let's, let's say that there is a different relation between a verb and the subject, and they are way more close to each other. And then um, PredNet architecture has used all these structures in terms of the images, and it extracts the explicit relational representation so that you can ask like questions, if these two objects are between, or if they are the same, if do they match the roles and so on. All these um, questions can be answered in a logical programming way. And it's a quite powerful tool to evaluate this. And uh, what we did was, okay, uh, so far PredNet and MHDPA, they are used for these very simple uh, attention mechanisms and to extract some relations. We said that why don't we create a more complex and interactive environment where we do try to extract relations. So think about it and not only uh, asking if this object is on the right side or on the left side and so on, but think about like a game environment where you have different type of agents, teleportation mechanisms, terminals, balls, and so on, so that you need to understand which one to take first, what is their relation with each other, and so on. So it was a very more complex uh, environment for the relational reasoning. And what we did was we had you compared it with the PredNet uh, architecture and we had taken the MHDPA as a baseline and we had seen that the, our proposed uh, architecture uh, has also similar outcomes like the box, box world uh, configuration, which is the uh, main uh, world in, in that sense. And also the uh, cumulative reward mechanisms were quite uh, similar so that uh, for the first time, we were able to create, let's say, more complex decision uh, making procedures, and uh, we were able to extract the relations of those. So, thank you very much. I, I hope I, I think uh, I did it on time. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, attention. Thank you, Ifojan. That was really a, a nice talk. Thank you. Uh, covering uh, different aspects of serious games virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, and uh, reinforcement learning. Um, any questions from the audience? Otherwise, I have taken some notes. I will, if you don't mind, I will go over them. Sure. Okay, um, so in the first part, um, I think the use of games um, is, is really brilliant for, um, for people with, uh, I don't know, handicaps. Uh, well, so with adaptive adaptivity, um, maybe we can integrate, um, they, they can better enjoy the game, uh, maybe get, uh, play the game longer, but do they, are we able to quantify whether such games can, improve uh, their, their handicaps? Yeah, uh, thank you, Sinan Hocam, for the question. For the first part, uh, first of all, I can start with the Rewire project. As I said, it was targeted for uh, stroke patients and also neglect patients. For the stroke patients, they were mainly playing it with Kinect and VFit, and they were doing lots of uh, physical exercises. For the neglect case, they were using the Novint Falcon and they, they were um, doing way more like cognitive and uh, weight-based uh, exercises. And uh, the thing is that since we had developed that uh, game, develop, uh, game engine, we were uh, able to introduce different exercises to those games. So you are using the same structure, but it is a, uh, you can, let's say, for sit to stand exercise or let's say, just to scroll right and back, you can use the same game. So we had that flexibility, the different exercises were mapped to the different games as well. And this was also creating some uh, difficulty and also change. And we made the patients to play those games like four months. Uh, so at the beginning, we made like a small usability uh, test to understand if they, are, uh, if they are usable and so on. 
and then they tested them for four months and uh, both uh, the neglect games and also physical games improved their health. Very good. Yeah. So um, then my other question is um, regarding the future of uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality. So there were some um, products from big IT companies like Google. There, there was Google Glass. We were really excited about Google Glass. We were hoping that we could uh, we could use that. So I, I think still um, um, I didn't follow why that ended up um, prematurely, for example, or were there some technical problems in terms of their wide acceptance? So and how do you see the future of such devices, their acceptance in, in end users? I mean, that's a very difficult question because uh, each year uh, on the Game Development Pipeline course, I'm giving that example. So there is this um, newspaper article from 1992, and uh, th there is this bus, and everybody is we wearing some uh, virtual reality headsets, and the headline is that next year we will be all living that like this, and it was like 1992. So unfortunately, this dream never comes true. I, I, I mean, you are so right that I was um, in the Games for Health conference in 2013, and we had it was the first time that Google Glass was used during an um, operation. So it, it was a medical uh, operation, and we connected to it online. We were in a conference. So I mean, it was wonderful. And we said that, OK, this is going to be huge, and so on. Uh, but uh, with the Google Glass, main problem was the security, because I mean it is very similar to uh, regular uh, eyewear, and it's very easy to use. But people couldn't know how to arrange the uh, security aspect of that, because I can record you without you even noticing, and so on. So it, uh, that that was, let's say, the dark side of the uh, Google Glass. In terms of the uh, HoloLens, for example, so far it is good, but uh, still we do have problems with the um, uh, visual uh, aspects of it because the uh, the uh, scope is very limited. So in order to see it uh, in a greater uh, field of view, you need to move your head a lot. It is heavy and so on, and we still do have all these uh, problems uh, as in virtual reality, all this uh, sickness and so on. So that's why it is an ongoing process. It is not very easy to uh, adapt, but still I, I'm very hopeful from both the HoloLens 2 and also the fact that uh, with two different HoloLenses, you can collaborate together. Let's say that we are trying to design something in 3D. I may switch it, you, you may switch and doing it in real time is going to boost both of different industries. But are we going to be uh, like using them in the bus next year? I don't think so. So. OK, thank you. Uh, and my last, um, if there are no questions from the audience, I will have my last question. Then we can switch the informal part and continue informally. Um, so regarding the last part, um, there are actually many people working on similar um, similar problems um, even from turkey i i know that akutoja akuterdem is working on um, their own um, environment where they do these kind of um, reasonings to uh, to train agents and they they introduce causality as well so which, which is very critical um, and there are people um, that we were able to train agents to do reasoning like this. So let's say yeah, a blue ball was moving and it touched a red square and that red square moved and touched another object. So, and the agent is able to answer questions like, uh, if there was no red uh, square, would, um, what, what would have happened? So mm -hmm. this kind of um, counterfactual um, reasoning can be included. So are you planning to, um, are you aware of these or do you want yeah, to? Yeah, actually uh, I'm aware of the studies on the image-based uh, side. As I had given some examples, they are 
uh, mainly focusing on like uh, where the object. So as you had said, there are some questions and they are answering it and they are trying to understand the uh, ca causality between two objects. In our case, we are trying to extend it a little bit uh, so that it's like a game environment and there are lots of uh, gameplay data and you do understand the relation between the, uh, let's say, uh, in order to kill the, uh, so this guy is bad, in order to kill that guy, I need to take the sword first, but I need to uh, go uh, ac across the mountain and so on. So there are lots of different sequential steps that you need to understand. That's the, let's say, the novelty when compared with the uh, image-based uh, environments. Uh, and in terms of the um, game testing part, uh, we are actually doing it with uh, I used to John Hoja from the Informatics Institute. And uh, our work was uh, very well um, um, received uh, from the gaming world as well. So, but uh, I mean, we had done it like two years ago, actually, although the paper was published recently, it, it was finished like two years ago. And now there are lots of uh, studies on the gameplay testing, uh, not only in gameplay, but also game testing as well. So both of those um, research topics are quite uh, recent and quite hot topics. Mm, okay, thank you. <laughs> there are no questions from the audience. Um, we can stop recording, then continue informally. Uh, can also thank stop you again, uh, Mr. Tony.